Pathfinders. So my name is Pastor AJ De Villiers, and I would like to welcome you to this online forum of honors for the Pathfinder ministry. You're here today because you're interested in learning more about what the Pathfinder ministry has in store with regards to honors. And I want to encourage you that if you would like to qualify for this honor, make sure that you subscribe to this channel, which is a bonus because you'll be receiving more information about honors that will be presented in the future. Then secondly, check the comments below and ensure that you fill in the form pertaining to this honor that you'll be watching. And remember to watch this honor completely because all the answers you need are within the video that's posted. So I hope you're going to enjoy yourself and that you'll sit back, learn a bit more and share this information with everyone that you come in contact with. May God bless you and may God keep you as you learn more about this honor that you'll be watching shortly. Enjoy. All right, everybody, let's bow our heads as we pray. Dear yeah, Heavenly Father, what a wonderful privilege it is once again to be awake this morning. You have all given us a good night's rest, and although it's cold outside, it is refreshing to be up and to be together once again. Father, as we are going to learn about nature and as we are going to learn about mammals this morning, we pray that you will be with our presenter. Please, um, be with the doc, give him the knowledge and the understanding so that he can transfer that to us. Thank you for everyone that has come on board. And we pray also, dear Heavenly Father, that everybody will have a good internet connection today so that we can receive the information. Please bless all our leaders and all our participants this morning. We pray this all in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Amen. Right, before we start, before I give over to you, uh, Dr. Be, um, I, I just want to welcome everybody and say, welcome here. I hope you have a blankie or a warm water bottle or a heater or something with you that will keep you warm so that we can continue with our uh, discussion and our honor this morning. And we want to thank you for, for, for the doc there from Kimberly that it is, is willing to do this for us. Please listen up and remember afterwards that you must not only just uh, be here, you must also complete all the other stuff that we send you so that we can tick off this honor for you. Thank you very much, doc. I give over to you. Thank you very much, Pastor. Um, uh, uh, I'm honored to actually be given this privilege to share uh, some information about mammals. Um, it would actually be very fitting for me to actually start this presentation by starting where it all began, and that is creation. Um, so I would like to, to start by referring to the Bible. Uh, the universe was created uh, by God. And in the beginning, there was nothing. And from nothing, God created something. And that was the whole universe. So in Genesis chapter 1, it gives us the whole activity of creation. And we know that it actually took place over a period of six days. And on the seventh day, God ended all his work, which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. That's what the Bible says. And I would like to quote verses in Genesis that actually state when the mammals were actually created, on which day or which days the mammals were actually created created. If we read in chapter 1 of Genesis, verse 21, in fact, if you begin from, chapter, from verse 20, it reads as follows. It says, God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and fowl that may fly above the earth in the open and in verse 21, it goes on and says, created every living creature that moveth, which the waters brought forth abundantly. 
see, after they are kind and every winged fowl after his kind and God saw it was good. So in verse 21, it actually states to us that there were sea creatures that were actually created then. And that was on the fifth day. If we go on in chapter one, verse 24, it reads, and God said, let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind. Kekel, creeping thing, and beast of the earth after his kind. And it was so. Yes. Um, okay, so I was on, on Genesis chapter one, and uh, the first creation of mammals was actually in verse uh, 20, uh one where it says that sea creatures and winged birds were created of all kinds that was on the fifth day so that includes your your your, your whales and all the other marine mammals then in genesis chapter 1 verse 24 god also created living creatures after their kind cattle creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind and so we know from that verse that terrestrial creatures, creatures, including terrestrial mammals of all kinds were also created on the sixth day. We know that this was the sixth day because in verse 31, it actually states that at the end of that day, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And the evening and the morning were the sixth day. So mammals were created on the fifth and day right and then just a bit of an introduction on on biology um and then we'll zero in to our study of mammals in general the study of living things is referred to as biology and biology is divided into the study of plants and the study of animals the study of plants is referred to as botany and the study of animals is referred to as zoology. There are several branches of zoology and they are as follows. Number one, there is the study of reptiles and amphibians, which we refer to as herpetology. And then there is the study of birds, which is referred to as ornithology. Then the study of fish is referred to as ichthyology. Last but not least, the study of mammals. This is referred to as mammalogy. I hope you will get that. Right, then now we go on to the classification of animals. We start at the top with the kingdom, kingdom animalia. And from the kingdom animalia, we divide into various groups but the specific phylum or the bigger group after the kingdom that we're going to look at is called the Codata. These are animals that have what is called a notochord. Um, in embryology or development of young ones, there is a stage where there is a formation of this structure called the notochord. And when the animals develop into adults, that notochord in mammals, becomes what is called the backbone or the vertebral column, okay? Then below the, the core data, there is a file, a subphylum, and that subphylum um, is the animals that have a backbone. And the mammals also have a backbone, so they belong to that uh, group called the subphylum vertebrata. Now, as we go down, there are more and more features um, for the fewer animals that make them similar. Now, from subphylum, we go on to class. The class that we're going to be looking at today is the class of mammals, and it's referred to as class mammalia. Okay? So the other four classes that we won't be looking at, but are also very important for you to know, are one, the class amphibia, and the class reptilia or reptiles, then the class for the fish, 
and then the class or the bed, which is the apes or the bed. So today we are going to be looking at mammals or the class mammalia. From the class mammalia, uh, the classification system actually comes up with smaller groups of more related animals. And for us, we are going to be looking at several orders for some of these classes below, these groups below the order, uh, the, the class, which are referred to as the orders. So there are several orders in the class mammalia. In fact, these have been changing several times because they, they chop and change, they combine some of these groups because some of them look similar, you know, with further studies being done, DNA analysis to see how related these animals are. So they found that from testing these animals, uh, to look at their genetic material, what is called DNA. Some of them have been found to be actually more related. So some of these groups have been fused or combined. So there are several of these orders under mammalia, and currently there are over 20 orders, okay? And then below the orders, then you've got even more closely related groups. And one of those groups is the family. So there are several families under uh, those various orders in the mammalia uh, class. And then further still, you get more, even more related uh, groups. And one of those groups is the species, okay? So below that family, we've got species, right? So there we are, we have a classification of animals. So right there, so we've got kingdom, and then from kingdom, we've got the phylum codata. From the phylum codata, we've got vertebrates. And then those that don't have a, a backbone, which are called invertebrates. Today, we are going to be looking at vertebrates. And in particular, we're going to be looking at warm-blooded vertebrates, which are referred to as mammals. On your far left, you can see that the warm-blooded animals are divided into mammals and birds. Right, interesting uh, information about mammals. Most of the mammals, including uh, the six most rich orders, belong to the placental group, okay? Those animals that have a placenta. Um, a placenta is the tissue that links the developing uh, young one in the womb or the uterus to the mother. And between the mother and that fetus or young one, there is exchange of materials and substances. One of those is oxygen, carbon dioxide, some other metabolic products or excretions, okay? So there's exchange between uh, um, the fetus, the young one, and the mother. So that takes place across the placenta. So there are some mammals that have a placenta. They are called placental mammals. Um, the three largest orders in numbers of species are the rodentia, which is basically your rodents, the mice, the rats, the porcupines, the beavers, the capybaras, and then other knowing mammals. Then we've got another order, Chiroptera, which is basically a, um, an order where all the birds belong. And then Soricomorpha, this group or order has actually been changed. We'll talk about it later. Uh, when I look at the, at the proportions of um, species uh, according to order in, in the class mammalia. So I'll tell you what changes have taken place. It's no longer referred to as Soriko. Is this duck still there? So this includes the whales and the even toad 
ungulates. Ungulates are hoofed animals. And then we've got another order, the carnivora, which includes cats, dogs, whistles, bears, seals, and alleys. So according to the mammal uh, species of the world, there are 5,416 species which have been identified as at 2006. But currently, the current information for 2018 actually um, moves that number up to 6,495. Okay, we'll see that later when I, I look at the latest information. So those are the various orders that we'll look at. But like I said, there are more orders under mammalia, actually more than 20 orders. So let us look at the characteristics of mammals. What really helps us to identify mammals as mammals, okay? First, if we could define what mammals are and then try and look at the characteristics. It's very difficult to get a definition that will actually define mammals uh, precisely uh, without uh, correctly, accurately, if I can say so. Um, one of those definitions refers to uh, mammals as warm-blooded vertebrates which bear their live ones, uh, their young ones live and also suckle their young. That definition, if you look at it, it's good, it's fair, but it's got uh, some uh, facts that are not really correct because there are some variations amongst warm-blooded uh, uh, mammals, okay? So females of uh, mammals have special glands. Now, this is what will distinguish other animals or that will distinguish mammals from other animals. The females of mammals have specialized uh, tissue, which is organized into what are called glands. And these glands are referred to as mammary glands. The mammary glands uh, secrete milk, okay, which is a special substance that is used to nourish the young ones. Okay, So that's a very special feature of mammals. They have mammary glands which produce milk. A special region of the brain is also present in mammals. And this uh, special region of the brain is referred to as the neocortex. Remember, the brain uh, is divided into a small brain and a big brain and a brain stem, okay? So the small brain is called the cerebellum. And then the big brain, which is right in front uh, of the of the of the cranial cavity, it's called the cerebrum. Okay, you can just refer to them as big brain, small brain. If it's confusing, big brain, cerebrum, small brain, cerebellum, and the brain stem, connecting these two structures of the brain. Okay, so the neocortex is actually the cerebrum. It is highly developed. And if you were to look under the microscope at this neocortex, it's got several layers, about six layers, which are all present to actually ensure that when these mammals uh, are actually receiving stimuli, they are able to process it, interpret it, and assimilate and learn. So it's very important for cognitive function. And this region of the brain is well developed in mammals. Remember, it's called the neocortex. So it enables uh, the mammals to perform specialized functions like uh, language or communication, motor commands, reasoning, sensory perception, also to process information and to keep some of that information. Okay. The other characteristic of um, mammals is that they have some small bones in the system for hearing or in the ear. Precisely, these small bones are found in the middle ear. 
you can also refer to them as the ear ossicles or small bones of the ear. There are three of them and they help to transmit sound from the outside when the sound from outside is picked up by the, the mama. It goes, it's caught by the pinna. Some of these mamas have got a, a flap of cartilaginous structure which catches this is the pinna. We've got a pinna as human beings. So that flap is called a pinna. It catches the sound, then the sound goes through a canal, which is called the external uh, ear canal or external, external auditory canal. Then it gets to the membrane, there's a, an eardrum or a, a membrane where the sound hits. And then when it hits that membrane, the membrane uh, vibrates and then transmits the sound waves to these little bones in the middle ear, okay? So there's the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Those are the ear ossicles or the small bones of the ear. Then those transfer or transmit the sound to the inner ear or the cochlea, okay? So that's a special structure which is present in all mammals. They have those three small bones. The other important uh, characteristic is that they have a basic tetrapod or quadruped or quadruped uh, body type. That means they have four limbs. Quadra means four or tetra means four. So all mammals have four extremities or four limbs. They'll be differently modified for the different uh, mammals. We'll see that later. Most mammals also have the following um, structures that actually characterize uh, mammals. They have fur or they have hair, okay? Which is not necessarily true for all mammals, but most of those mammals have fur or hair in the skin. The mammals, like we have said already, they give birth to live uh, uh, ones, which then suckle from the mother. It's not necessarily all of them, but most of them. We'll give you an example of the one that does not give birth to young one, but instead it gives, uh, it lays eggs, okay? There's a group or an order that does that and it's very unique. Another important structure that actually characterizes mammals is the presence of sweat glands, okay? And then you also have scent glands that produce some smell or a characteristic smell. Okay. And then we also have those glands that also produce some oil. Uh, they are referred to as sebaceous glands, or you can just simply call them oil glands. That's an important characteristic of some of the mammals. Mammals have teeth, and they do also have um, a, four, a, a, a heart, which has got four distinct chambers. Okay, So those are some of the characteristics uh, that you can use to help you to identify whether an animal is a mammal or not. Now, I'm going to do some sort of ranking uh, of the small groups under the class mammalia, okay? I'm going to look at all those various orders. In fact, I'm going to look at the five uh, top uh, orders. By top, I mean in terms of the number of species that each of those orders have. The first order or the first largest order in the class mammalia is the rodentia. This is the order which is the most number of species of rodents, okay, or species. So it is about 2,000 552, which makes up about 39% of all the mammalian species, okay? So that's the majority of, of species. Uh, so that makes it actually the largest order. Then the second largest order is the Chiroptera, where we've got the, the beds, and we've got about 1,386 species, and that makes up about 21% of the mammalian species. The third largest order, it's the hooved animals which have even toes. Remember they are called 
that killer. So your cattle, um, your, your pigs will fall under the order at your that killer. And these make up 8.5% of all the mammalian species. The fourth largest order, according to recent research, is the Yuli Potifla. Remember when I talked about the, the Soricomorpha, this one, we talked about it and said it's no longer referred to as the order Soricomorpha, rather it's now referred to as Yuli Potifla. Okay. Now, the fifth largest order is the order primates. So all the species in these five orders that we've talked about constitute about 85% of the known number of species of mammals. And we estimate the current number of mammalian species to be around 6,500. To be precise, 6,400. 95. Okay, so in comparison, I want to take you back to the other classes. Remember, we're looking at mammalia, and these are the groups under mammalia. Okay, and the total of the species is 6,495. It might look like it's a lot, but now just compare with these other classes. Now we've got fish there at 33,600, 33, birds at 18,000 species, reptiles at about 11,000 species. And then amphibia, 8,205 species. And then look at mammalia, it's at 6,500 species. So in comparison, we have very little species diversity uh, in mammalia compared to the other classes, okay? However, if you look at the mammalian species, there's a lot of different, uh, forms of the mammals, they actually vary in form or in structure. So that's called morphology. So there's quite a wide variation in structure amongst these 6,500 mammals, right? Let's look at uh, the classification further for the class mammalia. It's divided into three subclasses and the, the unique one or the smaller one is called the subclass monotremata. monotremata. This comprises those um, mammals that lay eggs. So the young ones hatch from these eggs and once they've hatched, then they suckle from the mammary gland develop uh, to mature young ones um, and then uh, they come out of the pouches okay not the pouches they the young ones feed on the milk from the mammary glands and they they, they grow off from there then the, the other subclass is the metatheria the metatheria um the females give birth to immature young ones who require further development on the mother's body. So the mother has a, a pouch or a fold of some kind. And then these young ones actually feed on the milk from the mammary glands of the mother. So the placenta is smaller and develops very, very late. Um, so this um, subclass actually includes the order marsupial, uh, marsupial marsupialia, which is the marsupials, the ones that have the pouch uh, in the females. So that includes the kangaroos, the Tasmanian devils, the opossum, the wallabies, the koalas, the wombat, and also the possum. That, that one wasn't included. The, the possum, which is also there in Australia. Last, we've got the third, we've got the third subclass then. And that subclass uh, is the one where these mammals uh, have the young ones developing in the womb or the uterus, and they are connected to the mother via a true placenta. This one is a true placenta, 
and they give birth to live ones after they've taken time to grow within the womb and to develop all the structures. And by the time they are born, they actually look like uh, um, the mature ones, only they are just small. Um, so under this subclass where there are two placentas, we've got the whole range of uh, the other orders. So the other two orders are not within this big subclass. So the marsupials and the monotremes are outside this class, and then the rest are within this class. So the rodents, the bats, the carnivores, the ungulates, both artiodactyly and the odd toed uh, ungulates or hoofed animals, the ulipotifila, uh, the, the whales, the lagomorphs, all of them, they are falling under this. They have true placentas. Okay. Let us look at the order Masupialia, which is the group of animals with that special feature, the marsupial or the, uh, the pouch. Okay. These are distinctive uh, in that they have a characteristic uh, pouch, okay, in the abdomen in which they carry the young ones. Like I said, they do have a placenta. However, the development uh, while attached to the mother is only for a short while. Then it goes out of the womb, crawls into the pouch and gets to a tit where it can actually suckle and develop further until it matures in the pouch, okay? So these marsupials are native to Australia and the Americas. The only marsupial in America is the opossum. The rest of the other marsupials are actually found in Australia. The marsupials may live up to five, five to 18 years with the kangaroos and Tasmanian devils living the least and the koalas living the longest. So most of these marsupials are mainly herbivorous. There we have a picture of these pouched animals, the marsupials. The only one that is not indigenous to uh, Australia is the one which is on the far left top side, the opossum. Then the rest, they are found in they are found in Australia and New Guinea and Tasmania. That's about uh, within the same vicinity. So Australia, Tasmania, and New Guinea. So, like I said, one of the marsupials which is missing here is the possum. There's an opossum, and then there's a possum. So the possum is found in Australia. It's different from the opossum. The kangaroo. Uh, the kangaroo uh, has a powerful uh, pair of hind legs. So that means that the muscles there are well developed, including the gastrocnemius muscle. Okay? They have large feet, which help them to actually hop from one place to the other. So the combination of these large feet and these powerful hind limbs actually makes them able to run at high speeds of up to even 70 kilometers per hour, okay? They also have a long muscular tail. This tail actually enables them to, to balance. The kangaroos have a small head, okay? It's um, disproportionately small. You can actually tell when you look at the whole animal that the, one of the main features is that it's got a small head, relatively small head. And in the kangaroo uh, uh, family, we've got four species. We've got the red kangaroo, the antilopine, antilopine um, kangaroo, we've got the eastern gray and the western gray. And of the four, the largest is the red um, kangaroo. All these are indigenous to Australia and they are all strictly herbivorous. The opossum, which we say is endemic to Americas, is the largest marsupial in the Western Hemisphere. It feeds on both vertebrates, invertebrates, fruits, 
and also fruits and insects. So that makes it in omnivorous because it combines uh, plant material and flesh. Okay, so it's not purely carnivorous, but it's a combination of flesh eat, eating and also plant eating. So the females of these opossums have an average number of, I think, 13 teeth. So, which means several of the young ones can actually be suckled in the pouch, okay? So one crawls up, find the teeth, suckles, the other one also find the teeth somewhere, develops. So you can have several of them developing in the pouch. If there are more uh, young ones than the number of teeth, some of them would uh, die uh, because they are not able to suckle and thrive. Order, um, the order monotremata, which is the monotremes, basically it consists of two, um, the echidnas and the, the platypus. And there's only one species of platypus. It's called the dark-billed platypus. And then we've got uh, a few echidna uh, uh, species. I think it's four of them. So it makes a total of about five species under this uh, order, monotrem. So we've got five species here. They lay eggs rather than bearing live one. So this is a unique group. It's the only group that actually lays eggs. Okay. So these are oviparous uh, mammals. The rest of the other ones, they give birth to live young ones. They are viviparous. Okay. So this is the only one which is oviparous. Okay. So they lay eggs, but like all mammals, the females uh, nest their young uh, with the milk that is secreted from those mammary glands. The monotremes also have hair. However, they do not have teeth. They have a snout or a beak. If you look at the platypus, that's why it's called a dark build platypus because if you look at it we'll see it we will see the pictures later on it looks like a typical uh, beak of a duck when you look at it there we go that's the duck build platypus look at that uh, that uh, front part looks like a beak um, that's the mouth so it's a semi aquatic uh, mama and the males actually possess at the back on those back legs they actually have claws or what are called spares and those spells those spares in males actually secrete or uh, produce a venom and that venom if uh, it's injected into a human being it actually causes intense pain however it's not fatal but uh, it can cause intense pain okay so the duck billed platypus, we said it's semi-aquatic, it lays eggs and is endemic to the eastern parts of uh, Australia and also uh, it's found in Tasmania. The male platypus, like I said, it's got that spear on the hind foot that delivers a venom that is capable of causing severe pain. But remember, it usually doesn't kill, but what it does, it just causes intense pain. The body of the duck-billed platypus is quite broad and there's a flat tail, which is covered with dense brown fur that traps a layer of insulating air. If we go back, there we are. You see that's a lot of fur that's covering the body and that creates some form of insulation and so keeps the animal warm. If we go back, we look at the feet also, we find out the, the feet are actually webbed. And this is a more significant feature in front, in the front feet, and it's folded back when these animals walk. The duck billed platypus uh, weighs about 2.4 kgs when it's mature. And the average temperature of the body of a duck billed platypus is 32 degrees Celsius. Unlike the placental mammals, if we look at one um, placental mammal, 
um, we have the, um, the human beings. Uh, human beings, actually the temperature is about 36.9, 37, okay? So it's slightly higher. Uh, young ones in the duck-billed platypus, uh, they have teeth, but adults do not have um, teeth. The duck-billed platypus uh, occupy or inhabit small streams uh, and, and rivers. They are carnivorous, feeding on uh, organisms like earthworms, which fall under the annelid worms, and they also feed on insect larvae. They also feed on freshwater shrimp. The other group of um, monotremes, which is referred to as the echidnas, have a diet of um, ants and termites. That's what they feed on. These echidnas have hair and spines. If you look at the photo, can you see the photo? Can you see the photo of the echidna? Yes, we can see it. All right. Yes. If you look at it closely, you can actually you can actually see the whitish spines, and then below that there are some hairs. Okay. And they have short, strong. Uh, limbs, there we are, those are short limbs, which are very powerful and are used for digging or burrowing. The echidna feeds by tearing open, uh, tearing open soft logs. You can see if you look at the short limbs, at the end they've got digits with uh, sharp claws. So that actually helps them to dig and tear. Okay, through the logs, the soft logs, and also the end heels. And using its long sticky tongue, okay, there is the long beak there. So in, in there, you find a long tongue, which actually protrudes out of the snout to grab hold of the, the prey. The echidnas, they use uh, caves and rock crevices to actually find shelter or to, to, to shelter from harsh weather or inclement weather. So those were the monotremes and the marsupials. So now we're going to move on to those orders that have a true placenta under the subclass Eutheria. Okay. So the the first one that we're going to look at, it's the rodentia, the order rodentia. We say that this is the order which has the most number of species, okay? So it's about 2,552 species under this order, and that makes up about 39 to 40% of all the mammalian species, okay? It is the most diverse of the orders and has the most uh, variable types of habitats. Some stay on trees or live on trees, some actually burrow, and some are actually semi-aquatic. Aquatic. The um, incisors in these rodents grow <laughs> continuously. So rodents have two upper incisors and two lower incisors. And these uh, incisors continue to grow. So if these rodents were to stop knowing at objects, knowing at food, knowing at uh, pieces of wood, then they would not be able to check the growth of these. And then they will continue to grow until they put in sort of cause injury. So 
That's why this audience continuously know at food and also borrow and try to keep the, the growth in check, okay? So most of the rodents are small, they have a robust body, short limbs, long tails, and amongst these species, the largest is referred to as the capybara. capybara. So the capybara is the largest and it weighs about 60 kgs. It has sharp incisors to know at food and excavate uh, barrels and also to defend itself. Rodents have uh, good senses of smell, uh, sight, and also hearing. They do possess what are called whiskers that actually help them to, to sense. And most of them actually are active at night, so they are nocturnal. Rodents may be born either blind, hairless, and relatively undeveloped, or they can be born with a bit of fur and the eyes open and fairly developed. So depending on the species in the nest, So what is the important, importance of rodents? Rodents can be used as laboratory animals or research animals, okay? Where they are used as models, okay? To simulate maybe what takes place in the human being before the uh, drugs are used in human beings, they are first used in, in these uh, model animals. So they are used as scientific models. But rodents can also be pests. Okay, so they can eat crops, they can eat food which is stored uh, by humans and they can also spread diseases. The other importance uh, of rodents is that their skin can actually be used uh, to make clothing and to make other leather uh, accessories. Some people keep them as pets. And the other one which I didn't include, some people eat these rodents. Uh, but we don't eat um, rodents. Why? Because we know the, the scriptures say we should not actually eat. If you read Leviticus chapter 11, it would actually explain to you which animals to eat and which animals not to eat, okay? So most rodents are actually herbivorous, feeding exclusively on plant materials such as seeds, stems, leaves, flowers, and roots. They have a strategy of dealing with um, times of plenty and times of not having plenty. So during times of plenty, they make sure that they eat as much as they can so that most of the feed that they actually take in, they convert into fat and that fat is then deposited in the body. So it acts as a reservoir for energy in times of need. Some feed on insects and soft-bodied invertebrates. There we are, we've got a picture of the various types of uh, rodents, okay, or various species. And one of the most important ones is the mouse, where we've got the house mouse, we've got the brown mouse and the black mouse, which are important in laboratory uh, research and also as pests. Now, we move on to another um, order, which is also um, forming a, a bigger uh, proportion of um, the mammals, and it's called the, Coryop the Cory Coryoptera, and these are pets, okay? They really do look like beds with the structures that uh, they use to fly, okay, that form the wing. So in this order, we have mammals that are the only mammals that are capable of flying. By flying, meaning that they have a, a sustained 
type of flying, not just hopping from one tree to another, but the, it's a true flight and it's sustained. It can move quite a distance. So that's the only mammal that is capable of doing that. The four limbs of the birds are actually modified to form wings. The smallest of these birds or the smallest of this order, uh, the smallest species, it's uh, the bumblebee bat. We're going to talk about it at length when we get to the end, okay? It's the smallest, you can actually carry it using one of your fingers. It's almost about two grams and uh, it's about 3.3 centimeters uh, in length. The largest bat uh, or bats are the flying foxes or the fruit bats. And these can weigh up to six, six kgs and they can be as long as 1.7 meters in wingspan. There we are, we have a picture of a, a bumblebee bat, which is the smallest mama, okay? And it has well-developed pinnas and also the pig-like snout. Then we also have, in South Africa, we also have a, a, a species, uh, which is referred to as the African yellow bat. So this one is the African yellow bat. At its bottom, on the bottom side or the ventral side, it's, it's got a yellow uh, color. Then the rest, it's, the rest of the body is black. Okay. It's also referred to as the yellow bellied house bat, and is one of the family members of the vesper bat. It is medium sized, rather attractive, with a dog-like snout. It is light brown above with a yellow belly, as I mentioned, and it is, its eyes are clearly visible and its snout is short and broad. The wings vary in color and may be olive, gray, red, while the interfemoral membrane or the membrane between the femur, the femur is the bone, uh, found in the four limbs, okay? So between those bones, you've got a, a, a skin, skin fold or a membrane that runs from one uh, femur to the other femur and it, it forms uh, these wings, okay? So the total body length of the African yellow bat is about 130 millimeters, which is about 30, 13 centimeters. The forearm length, when it's stretched out, can measure up to 58 millimeters. And its average weight so its average weight is about 23 grams. The African yellow bat is native to the sub-Saharan Af uh, African region including South Africa, and they can be as, uh, found as far as the Eastern Cape. They live in the savanna habitat and can be found in human habitation where they roost in houses. It may roost single or in small colonies, okay? The small colonies of about 12 individuals. So they find places to, 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 to reside in hollows and cracks of large uh, trees. And they also, feed on beetles, bugs, flies, termites, moths, and lace wings. So then the, the next order we are going to look at is the order of mammals, which are carnivorous mostly. So this is called order carnivora. The order carnivora, they have five toes in each limb. So remember we said mammals have four limbs. The two front ones or the two fore limbs and then the two hind limbs. So here each limb has five toes or digits. And each digit or toe ends in structures which are referred to as claws. Ne? And then these claws may or may not be retractable. You find that they are retractable in species like the lion. 
okay, for the cat. So most animals in this order are specialized in primarily eating flesh, but some are omnivorous, like the raccoons and the bears, or they may be herbivorous, like the panda. Okay, so there are about 279 species living on every landmass in the variety of habitats, ranging from polar to desert uh, areas. They do vary in body form and also in size. Just a look at the digestive system of the carnivores. Like I said, most of them, they eat flesh, but you find that there are some, like the panda, which are herbivorous, there are some, like the raccoon, which actually eat flesh and also eat a bit of uh, plant material. So based on what they eat, you find out that the, the digestive system or the digestive tract would actually adapt to what these animals eat. So there will be some slight variation, but basically they have a simple uh, esophagus in the simple stomach and the simple uh, uh, intestines, the large intestines and the small intestines. And if you look at the cecum, which is close to the junction between the large intestine and the small intestine, that cecum is not really that well developed in carnivores. It is developed in uh, uh, some hoofed animals like the, um, the zebra, like the horses, okay, like the rhinoceros, and those are actually referred to as hind gut femenders. So they've got a very big cecum. Human beings also have a very small cecum. In fact, it's very rudimentary, okay? So that's in simple terms, the digestive system or structure or anatomy of the digestive tract of a carnivore or carnivorous animal. So it's got a simple esophagus, simple stomach, simple intestines and large intestine with a, a very small rudimentary cecum, which actually doesn't have a specific function, maybe only in herbivorous carnivores, it might uh, uh, have a certain function. But in most of these flesh eating omnivorous carnivores, it doesn't have a, a function, okay? We have a picture there of a whole range of carnivores. If you look at that picture, in addition from previous uh, classifications, in addition to the carnivores, it's the, the seals. Remember these seals were referred to uh, as belonging to the order pinniped, the pinnipeds, ne? there was an order, but it's no longer that. So they've been actually grouped with the carnivores because of the similarity that they have with the rest of the carnivores. So you can see how dynamic this whole classification system is. So from time to time, because of information that is being gleaned that they are getting from the DNA analysis, from uh, looking at the anatomy, looking at the histology, then they find that there are similarities and they start to group them and group them together or even separate some of them. Now, let's look at an example of a carnival. We shall look at a, a, a domesticated dog, which is referred to as a canine species. It is man's best friend. And one of the characteristics of a domesticated dog is that it is very intelligent. The cognitive functions or the abilities have been found to be actually superior to those of other animals like the horses and the cats. They are very intelligent animals. They can learn some things. I'm sure some of you actually keep dogs at home and you've realized how good they are at actually identifying you and distinguishing you from a stranger. They can actually realize or even pick up if you are actually coming home, maybe by the sound of the car and you see them running straight to the, to the gate to meet you. So they're quite intelligent animals, okay? And various breeds actually exist. You've got your Assertions, you've got all sorts of breeds, small, medium, large breeds, okay, of domesticated dogs.
Okay. Now, another largest uh, uh, largest carnivore in Africa, which is a member of the big five, is the lion. Okay. It's got a, a deep chest. It's muscular, short, rounded head, round ears, hairy tuft at the end of its tail. From around five months, it starts to develop that tuft on the tail. Its fur varies in color from light buff to silvery gray, yellowish red, and dark brown, up to about 180 kgs uh, weight. That's how much it can weigh, 180. The adult males have a prominent uh, hair from the nape, which is referred to as the mane. And that starts developing from around a year old. They start developing that mane. The mane is that hair along from the neck going down like that. That's the mane. Okay. These are very social animals and they live in groups or what are called prides. And on average, each pride can have up to about 15 lions. The male cubs, uh, they leave the pride at around two years. Okay. Because there's always one dominant male. And that male will always be there up until maybe it's old and it's chased out of that pride. Then another one takes over. They do exhibit uh, various facial expressions. It's when they can growl, they can roll, they can meow. They also like head rubbing, uh, nuzzling the forehead, face and neck against another lion. Those are ways of, of them communicating. Lions live in grasslands and savannas. They do not live in forests, okay? But in South Africa, we know they live mainly in protected areas like your Kruger National Park. Lions are vulnerable, okay? They are vulnerable species, likely to become extinct. Um, they are mainly found in Sub-Saharan Africa, and also they are found in Asia. Their lifespan, okay, they can live up to about 20 years and they spend much of their time resting. They are inactive for about 20 hours uh, a day. They eat meat from various prey and they prefer to eat hoofed mammals, okay? Your zebras, your antelopes, your giraffes. So they can eat up to 30 kgs at any one time and they also scavenge. Okay, lions don't usually hunt and eat men, but they can seek out uh, human beings, especially the male lions. Lions occupy an important position in the ecosystem, okay, in the food chain. How? They do so by keeping the numbers of their predators at the bottom of the food chain in check, okay? You can just imagine if these predators were to, to grow and uh, uh, overpopulate the, the habitat, then there would be a problem. So they are there at the top, to make sure that the populations of these other animals are kept in check. Then we've got the order Artiodactyla. These are the hooved animals, which we said have even toes, okay? They bear their weight equally on two, that is even number of, of, of their five toes. The third and the fourth and other toes are either present or they are already absent, or they're just rudimentary or vestigial, or pointing at the back, and they're not used actually for bearing weight. They are able to digest plant material like cellulose in their stomach. Um, remember, these ones actually have four stomachs, so they can actually ferment and break down that, and then final digestion in the small intestines. Even toward ungulate species, they include the pigs, the hippopotamus, the antelopes, the sheep and the goats and the cattle, the camels also. There are different families within uh, this even toward uh, hooved animal um, order, the Archaeodactyla. Okay, the ruminants, these have four chambers or four, four stomachs and they are able to chew the cud or ruminate. They regurgitate the food and then they re-chew it and then swallow it. Pigs are omnivorous. They eat flesh and they also eat plant material and have a simple stomach. So they don't chew the cud, 
but they do have uh, split hooves or even toes. Tylopoda, which are the camels, the ilamas, and the alpacas, they have three chambered stomachs. They chew the cud. However, they don't have true hooves. Rather, they have what are called digits. So these are some of the animals that are referred to in Leviticus as being unfit for consumption. So we are not supposed to eat camels and llamas. There we are. If you look at that picture at the top, we have the, the camels, the camels uh, digits, those are not wolves. Then here we've got the even toed uh, limb, that is that it could be from a, a, a sheep or a goat or even cattle, okay? So it's got two of those digits which are actually bearing weight of the animal. So that's an even toed artiodactyla and that's a, a camel. Then we've got the odd toed ungulates. These are hooved animals which bear most of their weight on one of the toes. The non-weight bearing toes or the toes that do not bear weight are either present, they are absent, or they are rudimentary, or they are facing backward. Odd toed ungulates or hooved animals with odd number of toes, uh, they, able, they are able to digest cellulose in their intestine. Remember what I said, I said the cecum in these animals is slightly developed to actually break down plant material. So they are referred to as hind gut fermenters or digesters, okay? And they're exclusively uh, herbivorous. The largest of these odd toad ungulates is the rhinoceros. Okay, that's the foot of one of the, the llamas, which is similar to that of the, the camel. That's the camel with the, the odd toes. In fact, yeah, it's the odd toes, not even hoofed, okay? And at the bottom there, you've got the, the hooves of a horse or an equine, okay? You can even see the shoes that have been shod there. So that's a, a hoof of, a, of an equine. It is just one, um, it's not even. That's a picture of your ungulates, both even toed ungulates at the top and the odd toed ungulates at the bottom. The odd toed ungulates there, you've got a list, you've got a mule, you've got a horse, you've got a rhinoceros, you've got a zebra, you've got a donkey, and that one, I think it's a tape. Primates. Primates have a large brain or large brains, which are uh, relatively bigger compared to the body size. They also have an increased reliance on their sight at the expense of the sense of smell. So they use their sight more than they use their sense of smell for survival, for thriving. So which is dominant sensory in most mammals. But the smell or the sense of smell in monkeys is more developed uh, than in humans. So monkeys and apes have a, a, a more acute sense of smell than humans. Except for apes and humans, primates have tails. Primates also have slower rates of development than other similar sized mammals, and they reach maturity later and they have longer lifespans. Okay, so like human beings, some human beings can reach up to 100 years, 105, 104 years. So that's quite a long lifespan. Most are terrestrial, but can also climb trees. Primates are amongst the most social uh, of the mammals, forming pairs or family groups. Close interactions between humans and non-human primates can actually bring up the risk of transmitting diseases. In this case, these are referred to as zoonotic diseases. Um, zoonotic diseases are mm. diseases of animals which can actually be spread to 
human beings and human beings can suffer from those diseases, okay? Examples include Ebola, they include rabies, hepatitis, measles, and, uh, and herpes. Right, uh, common threats uh, to these primates in the wild include deforestation, forest fragmentation, monkey drives, primate hunting for use in medicine, use as pets, and also hunting them for food. Large scale tropical forest clearing for agriculture also threatens uh, primates because it destroys their habitats. Large head, large brain, binocular vision. That's how uh, you can describe these primates. They have a large head, a large brain, binocular vision. What it means, binocular vision, is that the eye sockets are all positioned in front of the skull. And so the eyeballs are positioned in such a way that they are actually forward looking. And when they look at an object, each of the eyes can actually see the same object. Okay? Furthermore, with that binocular vision, they can actually process the information. Each eye can capture that image. And then when it gets to the brain, we see that object as one. We do not see it with the separate eyes. It's integrated. And when you look at the object, it looks as a complete object, not two images. So that's, that's an important thing about primates. Okay. So they have characteristic keratin fingernails on the end of each finger and toe. That's a picture of a range of primates with the women being right on the left extreme. And these are the zones in the world where the wild primates uh, find their habitat. You can see that as you go towards the poles, they actually, there's no habitat for them. So they occupy these temperate areas, these tropical areas. Um, rapids, okay, now, the order lagomorphs, they are similar to rodents. The only difference of these lagomorphs, which is the hares and the rapids, the difference between them and the rodents is that um, they are strictly vegetarian. They have four incisors at the top or at the max, on the maxilla. So they have four upper incisors, two lower incisors. Remember the, um, the rodents, they have two upper incisors and two lower incisors. This time it's four upper incisors for the lacomorphs and two lower incisors. However, they are the same. They also continue to grow, okay? Lacomorphs uh, jump, they push off with their strong hind legs and use their forelimbs to soften the impact of landing. So when they jump, then they land on their uh, forelegs, softening the, the whole landing process. They are found everywhere except the Antarctica, and the hairs are larger with longer ears and longer hind limbs uh, than the rabbits. Baby rabbits called kittens are born blind and hairless and totally depend on their mother. Baby hairs, they are called leverets. They are born with fur and, and they have a sight or they are, they, they are able to see and they can move on their own within an hour of their birth. Rabbits are capable of burrowing underground and hares make nests above the ground. Rapids are very social and like groups and they can be domesticated. So there we are. Cetacea, which is the whales and the dolphins. These are large, they have teeth and some do not have teeth. Although the cetaceans are widespread, most species prefer the colder waters of the northern and the southern hemispheres. They spend their lives in the water of the seas. They feed largely on fish and marine invertebrates. But a few, like the killer whale, they feed on large mammals and birds, such as penguins and seals. These cetaceans or dolphins and, and, and whales, they have uh, a good mechanism for 
producing sound. They've got good vocalization. The young ones, or what are called calves, they're able to nest from their mothers, just like typical mammals. The dolphins are commonly kept in captivity and are even sometimes trained to perform tricks and tasks. If you have gone to Deben, you probably could have seen some of these actually performing in one of these pools in Deben. Um, they're quite intelligent. There we are, there's a range of uh, these cetaceans or the whales and dolphins. So they are sea or marine or aquatic mam uh, mammals. Otter sirenia, these are fully aquatic. Okay, they are herbivorous and they inhabit swamps, rivers, estuaries, marine wetlands, and coastal marine waters. So they're found in the Amazon, West India, and West Africa. And they can grow up to five meters and weigh up to 1.5 tons. They inhabit warm, shallow coastal waters and rivers, and they are referred to as sea cows because their diet consists of sea grass. Okay, how much time do I still have? Can you hear me? How much I time think do I you still have? have about 10 minutes, Doc, or 15 minutes, because our next honor is starting at 11 o'clock. <laughs> That's fine. Um, so these are the manatees. Uh, we shall come back to that photo. Um, So the sirenia, basically they are made up of two um, mammals, the manatees and the dugongs. And what we have there is the manati. Okay? The manati is got a, a rounded uh, mouth and these limbs or extremities are developed into flaps so that they can swim. And the difference between the manatees and the dugongs is that the dugongs do not have a split uh, fluke or what some people might call the tail, okay? It's not split, it's complete, it's round. But if you look at the, the tail of the manati, it's actually split there and it looks like a fin of a fish with a, a midline actually dividing it there. Okay, so what is the value of mammals to, to mankind? Uh, since some of the animals have been domesticated, it has helped uh, men to actually start um, agriculture, okay? To keep some of the animals for food, to actually use some of the animals to, to farm crops, okay? It has actually helped men to stop moving from one place to the other, hunting and gathering, and live in one place, and also promote them to now start uh, you know, uh, civilization of some sort, okay? So these domesticated animals, they provide uh, power, draft power uh, for agriculture, as well as for food, like I've said. The mammals are also hunted, the wild ones are also hunted, and some are used actually in, in various sports, okay? Like some hounds. And also they are used as model animals or scientific models, like I referred to with the rodents for laboratory experiments on drugs um, and certain uh, diseases like tumors, how they respond to certain medications. So they can actually do a lot of experiments using some of these mammals. The dilemma that we have with human activity is that the numbers of some of these animals are actually dwindling and the animals are being threatened with extinction, okay? And some people also do a lot of poaching, habitat destruction through the deforestation to make way for more space for cropping. So that is actually affected um, the mammals, the species diversity in mammals. And the other thing also it's pollution some of these mammals are actually very sensitive and they've actually died and are almost facing extinction because of pollution of some of their habitat. <laughs> right, we talked about the smallest animal or the smallest mammal, which is the bumblebee bat. This one is found in, in Thailand and Myanmar in the caves. 
and they feed on insects, okay? We said it's as small as about two grams and it's as long as about 3.3 .3 centimeters. It is red, it's brown with a distinctive pig-like snout, which we saw. They feed on those insects, like I said, they forage during the evening and also during dawn. The females give birth to a single offspring every year. They do have special uh, uh, features like the uh, snout that looks like that of a, of, a, of a pig, which is why they're also referred to as kitty's hawk nosed bats, okay? And they also have this web of skin, which they use for flying and also for, for hunting insects or catching insects. That fold of skin is called patagium. And the one between the hind legs, it's referred to as the Europatagium. So they use that for flying, for gliding, and also for, for catching insects. So that's the world's smallest mama. That's the bumblebee bed or the uh, kids. Uh, that's kids uh, hawk nosed uh, bed because it, it has a snout like that of a, of a pig. The largest mammal is the whale, blue whale, and it can weigh up to 200 tons. I think that's the most important thing that we can say there. Then this is an ant eater. It's a medium sized, that's another order. It's a medium sized um, burrowing nocturnal animal, which is native to Africa. So it's also found in South Africa and it looks like that that's the end eater thank you all right thank you so much um i think we are now getting ready for the next item uh doc that was profound a eh? lot of information there yes, a, a lot of information i, I wish it, 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 there was more time to actually present it nicely thank you very much yeah 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 man yeah but um i benefited a lot like i said took me back to my junior secondary classes man. <laughs> yeah all right thank you so much guys we can we just close this session in prayer and then and then we get ready for the next one which comes in about uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for such a powerful information. I can just imagine, Lord, um, how this information, Lord, is going around the minds of pathfinders who are part of this. Just to know this little and yet very important um, information, details, about mammals and so that lord it also helps us on on how to treat them because we we, we have learned um, about them and and also to know that lord this all come out of your hand and therefore lord we are required to take care of them and we pray that lord as little pathfinders we may always be on the lookout lord for these mammals so as to protect them Thank you so much, Lord, for a wonderful time with our dog. May you continue blessing him, Lord, in his ministry. And thank you once again for the gift of life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.